Good afternoon. My name is Jen Saunders. I'm with the National Alliance to End Homelessness. I'd like to thank, uh, welcome you to our webinar today on homelessness as a state of emergency. Um, we're so grateful to be putting this webinar on in collaboration with the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council as well as the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness. We have a, a pretty packed agenda today. I just want to thank the many speakers who will be participating. Um, I will talk very briefly about the uh, paper that the Alliance just put out on this issue. And Matt Warfield is here with the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. He'll talk as well. Amy Sawyer will be uh, speaking from the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness. Seattle, uh, King County, we will hear from three communities today, uh, including Seattle, King County, uh, Mark Putnam from All Home, and John Gilvar from Healthcare for the Homeless Council will speak, uh, Healthcare for the Homeless Network. From Portland, Josh Alpert with the Office of the Mayor, and Ed Blackburn from Central City Concern will give uh, presentations. And then from Los Angeles, we will hear from Amber Ross from Healthcare for the Homeless Healthcare. Uh, just to provide a little, a brief overview of the, the paper that the Alliance put out in February. Um, the purpose of the paper, and I won't spend much time delving into it since many of you have already uh, seen it, is to describe the homeless state emergencies that re have recently been declared, reflect on how communities have used these declarations, and discuss nat national implications. Um, in ca the cases of communities who've declared, some of whom are on the call or on the webinar today, um, many have cited that declarations have provided an opportunity to create political will, generate community support, and engage stakeholders. They also increase the ability to raise, uh, quickly raise local funding for immediate action to remove barriers, such as zoning requirements and procurement rules. And with that, I will turn it over to Matt. Thanks so much, Jen. So I'm uh, Matt Warfield. I'm with the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. Um, um, so I'm just going to talk briefly about uh, the policy brief that we put together uh, looking at states of emergency. Um, the brief we examined uh, uh, declarations from nine jurisdictions that recently declared homelessness a state of emergency, civil emergency, or shelter crisis. Um, now, we didn't look just at official state of emergency declarations. We also included civil emergencies and shelter crisis uh, because they have some of the, uh, the same, um, uh, same outcomes as an official state of emergency. Uh, our goal was to analyze the types of policies that were being put forward and determine whether a state of emergency declaration could be used as an advocacy tool to advance permanent solutions. We found that most declarations focused on short-term, often temporary activities, while lacking long-term solutions. We saw this as a missed opportunity. As official statements by governing authorities, SOE declarations have the potential to promote awareness and provide a framework to enact more permanent policy solutions. These can include enacting local rent regulation laws, passing laws prohibiting discrimination by landlords against people with low incomes, supporting community models of housing, such as community land trust, and permanently altering zoning, building, and other regulatory codes to reduce the barriers to production of affordable housing. And with that, we will turn it over to Amy Sawyer with the U.S. Energy Agency Council on Homelessness. And we were working on getting the slides up. Very sorry about that. Amy, are you on? Hello, everyone. I am. Can you hear me now? We can. Hello. Great. I am glad to be here um, as part of this conversation um, with the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness. Um, as many of you know, we implement Opening Doors, which is the federal strategic plan to prevent and end homelessness. And we recognize that there are thousands of Americans sitting on our street, so there is a real sense of urgency to address homelessness right now. And we have seen that some officials may find that declaring states of emergency really allow them to act quickly and with more flexibility. And we also know that we need to respond with solutions that will work, such as housing first, rapid connections to affordable housing and permanent housing, and really matching that housing with the right level of services. Um, so we really. As we talk today and as we listen to um, the experiences of communities that have um, um, are really trying to address this sense of urgency, uh, we need to make sure that we can really um, address the scale of homelessness and scale of our responses to partner with local, state, and federal resources. Um, and I wanted to um, close or conclude um, my 
um, introduction and welcome to this conversation by just mentioning that um, President Obama's fiscal year 2017 budget reflects the need to act with urgency and to end homelessness in this country once and for all. Um, it requests nearly $6 billion in targeted homeless assistance across federal agencies, which is an 11% increase over last year's budget, along with an additional $11 million over 10 years in mandatory funding um, to maintain, to really end homelessness for families by 2020. And it would also extend the USICH sunset date, which is currently scheduled for the end of um, 2017. So it would last uh, through 2020 in order to align with the goals of opening doors. So for communities that have declared a state of emergency as well as, as well as those that have not, these historic investments in proven cost-effective solutions will drive us toward realizing a goal of ending homelessness America, in America. Um, so as you listen to today's presenters, consider what it will take to rally support, investment, and a coordinated approach to end homelessness in your community. What type of leadership, investments, and systems design do you need to make a difference? Thank you, Amy. Um, Mark? Yes, this is Mark. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. So this is this is Mark Putnam. Um, I'm the director of All Home, which is the um, continuum of care and strategic planning body for Seattle King County. Um, thanks for the opportunity to to talk about um, the work that uh, that we're doing in uh, in King County. I think that you all in November, um, our mayor, uh, Seattle Mayor Ed Murray, and King County Executive Dow Constantine um, issued declarations that homelessness is in a state of emergency. Um, our executive uh, compared it to um, uh, a declaration of a natural disaster. Um, he said emergency declarations are associated with natural disasters but the persistent and growing phenomenon of homelessness here um, in King County as well as nationwide is a human-made crisis that's just as devastating to thousands as a flood or a fire. Um, so that, um, that really got us, uh, got us going. We've been talking about it for months in advance um, and uh, came to the conclusion um, we had actually had advocates um, of some months before really uh, request and push on, on our, uh, our elected officials to do this, to declare it a state of emer emergency. Um, and uh, the, the uh, electeds uh, decided to do that, and I think it was um, uh, huge in a number of ways. So I'll talk through today just um, a little bit about um, some of the local actions and then the state and federal advocacy and organizing that we're doing um, to, to make a difference uh, from those ends as well. Um, so from the, from the local side, our state of emergency included new and realigned existing funding from the city um, of Seattle and King County, and that raised our annual um, non-capital funding that's spent on housing and services from about $80 million per year to $90 million. Um, so it increased at about 10 million. It wasn't a huge investment, uh, but it was significant, and it uh, really targeted, um, really focused um, on a number of parts of um, our community's uh, overall plan around um, making homelessness rare, brief, and one time. Um, so I will get into some of those initial or some of those um, those specifics uh, in a couple of minutes. Um, Overall, the goal of the declaration was to draw attention uh, to the large increase in the number of people sleeping outside um, in the region. Uh, we just had our one-night count, uh, which is our point-in-time count, uh, in January that happened after the state of emergency, but uh, it showed for the third straight year a double-digit percentage increase. Uh, we now have 4,000. Uh, 500 uh, people living unsheltered across King County. Um, just for comparison sake, Seattle is about a uh, population about 600,000 and King County 1.8 million. Um, the state of emergency uh, declaration was also an effort to inject some new emergency funding and programs specifically serving uh, people living unsheltered. Um, to the second, uh, to request additional assistance uh, from the state and federal partners 
and third, to broaden public engagement and build uh, greater awareness of the issue. I'll just say for a second why the focus um, on the state and, and federal government. I'm sure that's not um, uncommon uh, for, for all of you um, across the country. We really felt like this was an opportunity um, and, our, and our mayor and our county executive used this, um, used their, their, their platform um, to, to really talk about this, that, that we, we need a stronger partnership. Uh, from our state and local government. We, our state has the, the most regressive tax structure in the nation. We're one of the few without income taxes, and so we tax the poor in Washington state um, at a higher level than, than the poor in any other state in the country. Um, that, that tax structure leads to a lack of uh, investment in safety net resources um, and affordable housing. Um, and then at the federal level, Similarly, we've seen and, and we're using kind of going back to 30 years back of just showing the disinvestment um, at the federal level in housing capital um, and mental health services while increasing really the homeless services um, through the continuum of care and other, other sources over the years, um, but, but overall a decline in those, uh, those federal housing and mental health services. Um, the next uh, slide that you'll see uh, is just to detailing some of the actions that we've, we've taken. Um, so they include um, more shelter and housing. So there's kind of three categories. We had more shelter and housing, expanded behavioral and physical health services, and enhanced outreach um, to encampments and vehicle residents. Um, all of these actions really take place within the context of um, our community's plan around addressing homelessness that, that All Home um, created and refreshed. It's a successor to our 10-year plan. And so that includes things like um, uh, Matt was talking about earlier, the you know, state and local tenant bills, um, addressing housing policy, um, adding um, detox facilities. Um, we just created a new uh, opiate uh, task force the mayor and the county executive convened to address the, the heroin epidemic. Um, we also uh, are doing a campaign right now to um, pass a housing, affordable housing levy that will focus on housing first for people experiencing homelessness. Um, the mayor has proposed doubling um, our existing affordable housing uh, levy. And then the county passed a, um, a youth and families um, prevention bill or levy uh, called Best Starts for Kids that's going to infuse new resources for prevention and diversion for youth and families. Um, so all that happens in the context, but in, with that 10 million of new investment, um, Seattle and King County added almost 300 shelter beds um, and funded new diversion and rapid rehousing programs um, and, and provided some motel vouchers uh, for families and single adults. Um, as far as uh, the next set of actions, which are around behavioral and physical health services, um, John Gilvar will talk uh, some more about that from our local Healthcare for the Homeless network. Um, Seattle and King County partnered to expand a mobile medical van, um, expanded mental health services at young adult programs, and then also um, uh, added new vouchers and services uh, for those leaving our drug court and also psychiatric hospitalization. Third set of actions were around outreach to encampments and vehicle residents. Um, we have about a third of our unsheltered population uh, are uh, are living in their vehicles. Um, so s about 1,600 uh, people living in vehicles across King County uh, were counted during our our um, our count uh, in January. Um, and we have a couple of we've had for uh, some time a couple of um, safe parking lots hosted by churches. Um, and so what the city of Seattle has done is added um, some parking lots on city property. Um, oh, I see the slides are up now. Um, so added some, some safe uh, parking lots on city property with case management and really with a focus on housing placement. So those are just getting up and running. Um, we also have um, more funding for outreach to people who are unsheltered and uh, and particularly highly vulnerable people, um, and pairing that, uh, we call them multiple, uh, multidisciplinary teams uh, with police, uh, sometimes people from transportation, always with outreach workers. Um, and uh, that has uh, not been without, without controversy. Um, 
and uh, I think the the city of Seattle and other other cities in King County are are still working to to figure out the the exact right approach, and we have uh, a meeting a convening about that with all the cities um, later this week. Thank you. Um, so with the we're working as I said earlier with. Um, uh, on the state of Washington and uh, Congress. So our state, like many of you, so I assume, um, are in session right now. Um, and so we're working on a couple of different things, um, including uh, working with the governor on supporting, um, uh, securing uh, some Department of Transportation uh, land um, and, and securing that uh, for public health and public safety. Uh, reasons uh, while also combining and using our local resources to ensure that we're making uh, um, offers of housing and services uh, to everyone that is, uh, is being removed from an area under I-5, um, uh, which is the interstate um, that runs up and down the west coast. Um, so the second thing we're doing is uh, working with our King County state representatives to pass some new bills. Um, we uh, had uh, strong leadership um, from um, a Senate, um, Senator Sharon Nelson, a Democrat from Seattle, uh, who proposed um, $200 million more in funding for, uh, for homeless services statewide, housing and services. It included permanent support of housing, rapid rehousing, um, a lot of the, the interventions that, that we need more of. Um, it's, uh, they're, they're working on the budget in, in Olympia uh, this week and they're really winding down um, and starting to really, uh, it looks like uh, some of that funding is still on the table but it's been, it's been cut pretty significantly um, and, and we're hoping to, to get uh, any, any new funding at this point. Um, I, I'll, I'll say just a, a bit about the um, work at the, at the federal level as well, We're really focused on, on Congress and, and the next budget, um, very um, happy with and supportive of the President's budget. Um, the, the mayors on the West Coast, um, really from San Diego up to Seattle, the, of the larger cities, formed an alliance um, and if, um, as part of that um, also formed a, a federal legislative agenda, um, really focused on expansion of um, programs like HOME and CDBG that, uh, in, that will help us on the capital um, development side as well as um, rental assistance programs uh, that will help us uh, support uh, people uh, living in the community in private market housing. Um, so that's, um, those are all really, really important um, for us and, and we know that at the state and the federal level it's a, it's a long haul, um, but the, the increased um, awareness we think is really uh, starting to pay off and has already uh, led to, um, led to some, some wins, um, particularly at the state level. Um, next slide. And I will wrap up here, I know I'm uh, running out of time. Um, so additional action, we, we've, we're doing um, quite a bit of work around um, community engagement and awareness. Uh, we have, uh, I would say homelessness uh, is, is one of, if not the, uh, the, the, the biggest community conversation right now. How do we address this issue? It's in the news every day here and in, in every community conversation. And so uh, we are working hard. The, from the governmental level, but also the faith community um, and regular residents to uh, engage in conversation and in social media and increase awareness about the need and the solutions. Um, we also um, are seeing, as I think most uh, communities across the country, but certainly on the West Coast, um, a growing heroin epidemic. Uh, and so we formed uh, the mayor and, and county executive uh, last week announced a new task force um, and also the announced um, opening some new detox uh, facilities um, and are looking at really any and all options um, to, to really get on top of um, an epidemic that's um, that's spiraling here in our community. And then the increased uh, collaboration and learning among West Coast communities where we're seeing higher rates of unsheltered homelessness than, than uh, the rest of the country, um, broadly speaking. Um, and so we are, uh, we're really learning a lot. Um, I was in San Francisco yesterday with our mayor and council members and county officials um, visiting uh, a site in San Francisco and learning from them and, and other communities are doing, doing the same. And um, that's been a really uh, important um, development.
development coming out of the state of emergency for us. So I will pause there and, and uh, John will be able to speak uh, next about uh, some of the important uh, healthcare connections for um, people living unsheltered in, in King County. Hi, Thanks, this Mark. is John. Uh, John, you can go ahead. Okay, great. If we could advance the sli slides to the next set. This is John Gilvar. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to participate. I'm the administrator for the King County Healthcare for the Homeless Network. We're uh, a network of 10 provider agencies that serve over 18,000 unduplicated homeless individuals each year. Um, we have about 140 direct service uh, full-time equivalents. Um, we're led by the public health department where I work with a budget of about $20 million. And we provide, we and our partners provide a really a really wide array of services that are range from medical, dental, behavioral health, case management in a wide variety of settings. So a lot of those services are pro provided on an outreach basis. Many are in permanent supportive housing buildings, shelters, uh, we have a medical respite program and I could answer answer further questions that there might be during the Q&A. Um, next slide, please. Um, just in terms of the impact of the state of emergency strategies on our healthcare for the homeless network providers, about $700,000, which is approximately 10% of the city of Seattle's state of emergency investment is dedicated to uh, healthcare for the homeless programs. And what we found so far is that provides us, uh, not only is that uh, uh, funding critical services, but it's also providing an opportunity for education on integrating homeless housing and healthcare best practices. It's one of many forums, one of, one of many opportunities that we've got. Uh, we're work, working closely with Mark's group and others, um, both inside and outside of government, to, uh, to integrate best practices. The next slide. So specifically, the state of emergency funding for um, healthcare for the homeless services focuses on outreach-based services uh, that are integrating uh, navigation to shelter, housing, and treatment. Um, so the two are the REACH program, uh, which is outreach and case management targeting people with chronic substance abuse conditions and the mobile medical program, which is a uh, RV-based clinics that are stationed at meal sites that integrate physician, dentist, nurse, uh, chemical dependency, uh, mental health social worker, and uh, benefits enrollment services. So this, uh, this combination of services and this particular uh, outreach-based approach and integration with outreach to people who are unsheltered um, provides just a really um, great opportunity for, for um, education and specifically what, what I found in this initiative, this state of emergency initiative as well as others that are, that are out there in our community seeking to integrate housing and health healthcare best practices is um, you know to, we kind of one of the one of the ways that I think we can kind of ground the discussion is uh, by actually looking at specific client uh, stories. So I'm going to just if you'll uh, humor me here, I'm just going to provide a very brief story about how the mobile medical program and the um, and the REACH program have worked together. So um, I'll just launch in here. Sid is a 50-year-old Anglo man who grew up in the Puget Sound area and has an extensive history of traumatic brain injury, which likely contributes to difficulties with focus and impulse control. When, when Sid first visited the mobile medical van, in June 2015. He was living in a tent in the woods in Federal Way, which is a suburb south of Seattle, and struggling to recover from an injury he, he had sustained at his job with a roofing company. He had stepped on a nail, his foot had become infected, and he struggled to keep the wound clean. Unfortunately, he waited until his foot became infected before seeking help, and by the time he arrived at the medical van at one of the Federal Way meal sites, his foot was in such bad shape that the doctor sent him directly to the hospital. Over the next several months, Sid returned to the medical van several times, frustrated that his foot was not healing. In the course of working with him, the van's doctor and nurse connected Sid to case managers from the REACH program, which provides the chemical dependency specialist who works on the medical van, as well as a housing case manager to whom the van regularly refers patients. Both these REACH providers were able to establish trusting relationships with, 
trusting relationships with Sid and began to engage him around the substance use and housing problems that were compromising his ability to take his antibiotics as prescribed and to heal. Then during a visit to the van in October, the doctor found that Sid's foot had swelled to three times its normal size and sent him to Harborview Medical Center where an MRI re revealed that the infection had spread to the bone and where the doctors informed him that the only chance of recovery necessitated amputation of his foot. After hearing this news, Sid had an emotional outburst that was so severe that it foreclosed the hoped for option of his staying at the Edward Thomas House Medical Respite Program, which is op operated by the hospital. Although Sid was discharged back onto the street, he maintained his connection with his REACH housing case manager, who was able to create a temporary shelter arrangement that allowed him to rest and gain some stability. Over the next five months, the strength of Sid's relationship with his case manager began to pay huge dividends. Sid began daily inter intravenous antibiotic treatment at Northwest Hospital's wound care clinic that lasted six weeks. His case manager stayed in nearly daily contact with him, helping him to overcome transportation issues, obtain a knee scooter, and maintain his ability to succeed in temporary shelter. She also stayed in touch with his wound care nurse at Northwest Hospital, ensuring that Sid complied with his treatment plan and managed his frustration and impatience to heal. In February, Sid received the news that he likely would not need an amputation after all, based on the progress of his wound treatment. He has begun working with his case manager to apply for a, the, a disability benefit through Social Security and for permanent supportive housing. He understands that his substance use compromised his ability to recover from his infection and reports that he has stopped his use. Because of some prior criminal justice involvement, Sid faces some obstacles to, to obtaining housing, but his case manager is hopeful he'll overcome these problems as he's overcome his dire medical crisis. So thanks for, thanks for letting me go through that. I, I really can't think of anything else to, that, uh, other than that story that would kind of convey the approach that we're trying to take in integrating housing and healthcare um, as part of this uh, state of emergency. And the next slide is just my contact information, and I will hand it over to the next speaker. Great, thanks. Hi, everyone. This is Josh Alpert. I'm Chief of Staff to Portland Mayor Charlie Hales. And a lot of what I'm going to say is going to sound very familiar based on what you just heard from Seattle. And that is um, largely unintentional, but indicative of how closely we are um, connected uh, up and down the West Coast on this issue, and in fact, um, as Mark had mentioned, we uh, have formed a new alliance of uh, West Coast cities and mayors within those cities to talk about a whole bunch of issues, and particularly and most recently around the issues of uh, housing and homelessness. So a lot of what I'm going to say uh, is stuff that you've heard from Mark, uh, and uh, we think that's a good thing because the more aligned we are and closely tracking each other's movements on all of this, uh, the better off we think we're all going to end up being. Um, so uh, if you go to the first slide, uh, just a little bit of background about how we got to uh, the idea of declaring a state of emergency. Um, we uh, certainly here in Portland over the past couple of years have seen uh, not so much an increase in the number of unsheltered people on our streets, but a huge increase in the visibility of those people. And that was for uh, a variety of reasons, probably the largest being that uh, we have been a victim of our own success in developing our city out. Um, we, there are very few forgotten corners left in Portland, and that means uh, just a, a big increase in the visibility of people who formerly were um, finding places to sleep that were much more out of uh, the public view. Uh, because of that increase in visibility uh, and maybe a, a slight increase in the number of uh, people out on our streets, uh, it led to more and more conflict around the city. And of course, as that goes, uh, here in the mayor's office, we were hearing more and more every day from constituents who were concerned uh, about all the issues that come with homelessness. People started to ask us, and uh, commissioners within our own building too, of you know the question, well, how would we handle this if this was a natural disaster? Uh, and where are the relief agencies that uh, that work in that space when there's a hurricane or an earthquake? And uh, we were thinking the same thing, and so used that as an opportunity to go talk to the Red Cross and Mercy Corps and other uh, relief agencies that work typically on natural disasters. And 
uh, unfortunately heard uh, a lot of, well, it's not within our mission and we're already tapped out in other places around the world uh, and, um, and, 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 and that went on. And in fact, the Red Cross uh, right around that same time had uh, pulled out of their operations of our one of our emergency shelters in the winter, uh, one of our winter warming shelters, uh, as they were kind of realigning their programming and their mission work. Um, so we were kind of left on our own, and that caused me one night um, to uh, peruse our city code and particularly pay attention to uh, the chapter that deals with emergencies. And what I found there was, uh, the, or the thing that really jumped out at me initially was the idea that in a natural disaster emergency, the mayor has the authority to in, uh, enact rent control. Portland and Oregon uh, is preempted from having rent control. Uh, and I thought, aha, well, here's something that could be uh, particularly helpful as we move forward. So I called the mayor that night, uh, really excited, and, and he said, okay, well, let's talk first thing in the morning and think through what else we could use uh, a state of emergency for. Um, so we did that, and at that point, we brought our attorneys in uh, and recognized several things. One, uh, they weren't particularly clear whether uh, our city code was going to allow us to trump the state preemption on rent control. Uh, two, there wasn't a whole lot of interest within the city council on um, trying that play and enacting rent control because we hadn't put a whole lot of thought into whether rent control would actually be helpful or not. And three, there were a whole slew of other things within uh, our uh, city code during a state of emergency that we should be um, availing ourselves of. So we went through all of those and recognized that if we just put rent control on hold uh, and instead focused on the idea of waiving zoning and other barriers that we knew existed, uh, that that would be a way for us to uh, push much faster on the production side of housing units uh, and shelter siting and all the other things that take too long, cost too much money, and are too controversial. So the mayor, um, pretty quickly after the first couple of days of trying to figure this out, uh, made a, an offhand comment at a city council meeting that, of course, then uh, caused him to have a press conference soon after that council meeting uh, to talk about a, a state of emergency. We were uh, a little bit unprepared at that point to do that, but uh, he called a shot and said that the times that we live in require um, measures that we haven't seen the likes of before in Portland, and we are going to be spending the next couple of weeks really creating a proposal for all of council uh, to vote on whether or not we should be adding housing and homelessness to the definition of a state of emergency in Portland. Uh, at the same time, he said that that would come with a, uh, a funding commitment that he was going to make in the mayor's proposed budget, uh, and um, there would be more details later. In the upcoming couple of weeks after that, we met um, often with our um, partners at the county, uh, and the city and the county are separate entities here in Portland, but uh, very closely uh, related, and particularly on the issues around social service and housing and homelessness. Uh, we have a, a, a joint continuum of care called a home for everyone. And so we were all in the mix talking about what could we do here with provisions in our code um, simply by declaring the state of emergency or the city of emergency in Portland. Uh, we got to a point of uh, an ordinance that was drafted and we uh, I think smartly made the decision that while the mayor had the power just to declare this, we would have much more support if we got a unanimous vote from the city council to declare a state of emergency in Portland, which is what we went ahead with, uh, and got that support. At the same time, the mayor honed in on uh, his financial commitment uh, of $20 million and the county chair agreed to put in an additional $10 million uh, to issues around housing and homelessness. If you go to the next slide, please. So uh, the thoughts behind the state of emergency, other than just actual code provision uh, waivers, um, we, we recognized some of this ahead of time and some of it soon after we declared the, the state of emergency. One, it gave us kind of the moral authority to call our shot for the budget. Uh, we have a strange form of government here in Portland, but 
uh, the critical piece for this conversation is that the mayor gets to do the proposed budget. That then goes to the rest of council to um, put their puts and takes in, and then council votes, uh, including the mayor, on the whole of the budget. And so by declaring in October uh, that the 16-17 budget was going to have an additional $20 million, uh, in uh, to the Housing Bureau for Housing and Homelessness allowed us early to start shaping the budget way ahead of when we normally would. Uh, and that also then allowed us to work with the county, who had also declared a, an extra $10 million in their budget process to, do, to enter into some joint budgeting early, uh, much earlier than we would normally do that. Uh, it also allowed us here in our crazy form of commission government to bring a little bit more organization around a bunch of the bureaus that aren't within the mayor's control. The Housing Bureau, the Bureau of Transportation, uh, the Bureau of Development Service, which is our permitting bureau, the Planning Bureau. All of those bureaus um, needed to function together in one kind of big effort and declaring the state of emergency even just semantically allowed us to bring a little bit more cohesion to bureaus that are managed by individual elected officials. Um, but because we had decided to have all of council declare the state of emergency, that bought in all the bureaus that all of the commissioners run into that state of emergency. Third, uh, and probably the most important in my view of uh, the effects of declaring a state of emergency is it's given us really an opportunity for a year to do some experimenting. Uh, one, experimenting to figure out what barriers do we actually have here? Barriers to moving people from the street into housing, barriers to siting, uh, financial barriers, all of the barriers that, you know, we kind of thought maybe we had but never really had the time to really delve very deep into them to figure them out. And then uh, spend the rest of the year actually changing our code permanently so that we don't have to continue declaring states of emergency um, and instead just make actual code changes um, that we felt will streamline our process. Four, uh, of course, uh, and as Mark uh, talked about, it really galvanized our community. Um, you, you know, we've never done anything like this before and it got a lot of media attention and um, really uh, allowed the community to understand that we were prioritizing uh, above and beyond 10-year plans that had happened in the past. We were going to such drastic measures of actually adding housing and homelessness to our definition of a state of emergency and then declaring it that it really sent a shot to the public at large, to our business community, uh, neighborhoods, everyone, that we were serious about this and more details would follow. And then finally, um, it's given us political cover. Now because we have a state of emergency and because it really penetrated into um, the population at large that we were doing this, when we get to really controversial issues like citing camps uh, and RV parks and things like that, um, people say, oh, well, it's an emergency. I guess you have to do what you have to do. And I can't overestimate the power of having that kind of cover on really controversial topics. So uh, we crafted our ordinance, um, and really what we decided after some negotiating with council was that we weren't going to really use the ordinance itself to, to waive anything other than a couple of small, um, temporarily important things, uh, and instead come to council um, throughout the year on particular projects where we would need to waive zoning codes or building codes or other things. Um, so it was a fairly broad ordinance rather than a specific one. Um, and But it did create a timeline and put in the caveat that uh, we were declaring the state of emergency for one year, but then council had the option every six months to continue that state of emergency. That way, um, it gives flexibility to the next administration that comes in. This is our last year here in our, uh, in our mayoral term. It gives the ability for a new administration to come in and continue the work if there is still a need. We go to the next slide, please. So what we've done thus far, um, we started really, got right to work on shelters. Um, and first we looked at our own internal inventory and had a uh, former armory that the federal government owned that they deeded to the city for the future use of a West Side and, uh, Emergency Management Center uh, that's been sitting vacant, vacant for several years. Uh, it turned out we were actually out of compliance with uh, the federal government for not having already started work on uh, converting that into the emergency management center. And we brokered a deal with the federal government to allow us to use it for six months uh, to house 
Um, initially, it was going to be single women. We quickly expanded to single women and couples um, through the winter um, so that we could get uh, about 170 people off the streets. Um, that has been at capacity every night. Uh, we're still getting phone calls from the neighborhood, and this is a neighborhood that's a little bit on the outskirts of the central city, uh, a little bit more of a suburban area. We're still getting phone calls in our office asking when that uh, shelter is going to open up, which is music to my ears. Uh, it then led to uh, a, uh, a family who is a, a long-standing uh, developer family here in Portland to uh, step up to the plate and say, hey, we have something to contribute to. Uh, and they have loaned the city a, uh, a floor of one of their buildings. It's that top picture, um, kind of strange-looking uh, uh, walkway building there with the mayor on the right. Uh, they loaned us a floor uh, for about eight months to use to house single men. Uh, and again, went immediately to capacity. They're at 100 every night. Uh, and um, while both of those are temporary, we're already at, hard at work on uh, finding the tr transition sites to move uh, both those shelters into for longer temporary use or permanent use. Um, and we're, we're hard at work at that. We've now got uh, upwards of 400 additional shelter beds from when we declared the state of emergency, and our goal is to get to 700, and we've already identified uh, the vast majority of where those are going to be. Uh, at the same time, our housing commissioner, Commissioner Saltzman, introduced uh, a whole slew of tenant and renter protection ordinances, the first uh, that we've ever done here in the city, um, that require 90-day notice for uh, no cause evictions and 90 day notice for any rent increase above 5%. Uh, and uh, we also um, have seen the effects of galvanizing our community around this. We now have groups uh, calling themselves calling themselves Yimbies, Yes in My Backyard, that are sprouting up wherever we're having camps cited or shelters cited. Uh, and they're really taking this to heart, which is amazing. Uh, and then the budget, as I've mentioned, and right after we declared the state of emergency here, uh, we had our fall um, budget true up process um, just to kind of reconcile midway through our fiscal year. And at that point, uh, council allocated uh, $1.2 million largely to get that Sears shelter up and running and then uh, to have the operations money flow. Uh, and uh, council changed our urban renewal tax increment policy to go from a 30% requirement for affordable housing in uh, urban renewal areas to a 45% affordable housing set aside. Um, that will result in over $60 million over uh, the next 10 years additional for affordable housing. Uh, through a variety of different financing measures, we've already allocated about $10 million of our $20 million commitment, more hard at work in the budget process now of finding that uh, extra $10 million. Next slide, please. So uh, for the months ahead, uh, in fact, uh, right now in council, they're deliberating over our first real code change as a result of the state of emergency, which is going to streamline the affordable housing process and take it from a uh, what's known here as a type three conditional review process that is incredibly lengthy, gives neighborhoods uh, a lot of standing in that process, to a type two conditional review process, which is an internal staff driven process that can go much faster. Um, and we expect that to really uh, blow out our ability to build affordable housing here in record time. A lot more code changes are coming, uh, particularly around shelter siting, uh, changing the definition of what temporary is, uh, putting mass shelter into the definition of uh, permanent rather than temporary, all of the kinds of barriers that we've been identifying. Uh, again, the 10 million additional in the budget, uh, 700 new shelter beds, uh, and probably the most controversial thing that we've taken on and that um, we're going to continue to take on, which is how do we stabilize the current system on the street for people waiting to get into housing as we're trying to ramp up. Uh, that has uh, resulted in, uh, I think, an historic shift here in how Portland addresses people sleeping on our streets by really tolerating and, in fact, permitting both organized sanctioned camps by the city and the understanding that people are going to be allowed to sleep at night on sidewalks without 
tensor structures uh, by and then allowing tents and structures on rights of way and remnant properties as long as people are taking those tents down every morning uh, and we've ramped up day storage to uh, accommodate that so that's a work in progress uh, we're looking at best practices in Seattle and uh, Eugene Sacramento all over the place um, and adding our own wrinkles into that mix next slide And um, I think that's it, and I'll turn it over to uh, my colleague at Blackburn uh, at Central City Concern, one of uh, uh, our favorite and best providers here in Portland. Ed Blackburn, Central City Concern. Uh, just briefly about the agency, because I know we're short on time here, is that, uh, next slide, please. So we serve about 13,000 people annually uh, through a continuum of care that would include about 1,600 units of uh, very low income housing, almost all of it's 30% below. And then we also provide on a scattered site basis uh, through rental vouchers housing for another uh, 300 uh, people, mostly people with serious mental illness and chronic homelessness. We also provide integrated health care services. So we are a health care for the homeless, uh, FQHC. We provide services for about 10,000 people in those array of clinical services that include uh, integrated uh, primary care, uh, specialty addictions, and specialty mental health with a lot of adult office case management and supportive housing services. Um, we also uh, provide uh, um, access to income through supportive employment programs and other uh, training programs that we have or access uh, to SSI benefits for those who are disabled. So i just brief overview. Next slide, please. I want to talk about some of the basics here, about what's happening in Portland metropolitan area, but also in other places, uh, particularly on the West Coast, but some other places uh, in the Midwest and East Coast as well. Uh, if you look at affordable housing and what's happened, there's some really startling facts that uh, we've lost about uh, 3 million low-income housing units nationally between 1970 and 2000. And in terms of single-room occupancy, uh, occupancy units, you see some of the cities here, uh, Portland lost 70 percent and uh, San Francisco lost 50 percent. So just the supply of very low-income housing, uh, we've, we've made uh, major losses in that area. If you look at the relationship between incomes and rising rents in the Portland area, uh, you'll, you'll see that uh, the uh, median renter income has actually uh, gone down to 1994 levels, and, and, and also the median gross rent has uh, markedly increased, and uh, I think it's about a 63% increase since 2006. So next slide, please. Uh, what this shows is the uh, Portland housing market compared nationally in some other cities that have seen um, really uh, significant uh, rent increases from 2014 to, 20, uh, to 2015, uh, just one year. And you could see uh, the, the ones that are the darker red are those, uh, are those states that have seen the highest rent increases. And if you see the bar graph to the right, you'll see that San Francisco, Denver, Portland, San Jose, Seattle. Uh, make up for uh, the vast majority of the top, I think it's eight, eight cities. I think if you look at the Seattle metro areas, apart from the rest of the state of, uh, of Washington, you would, they would probably be in that dark, uh, dark red as well. So yeah, it, I, actually it's on there. Okay. So next slide, please. And uh, there's been a lot of building of apartment buildings here in the last uh, several years. Uh, but the average of uh, the average uh, apartment building rents right now for a one bedroom is 14, a uh, little over $1,430 a year. Uh, the average monthly rent, however, of the new newly constructed uh, constructed one bedrooms is almost $2,000. Excuse me, a month. You can see there are a lot of units, 13,000 under construction. But under 5% will be affordable to someone making $30,000 a year or less. And for those uh, making minimum wage or less, uh, 
0.05%. So we have a housing market crisis here as well. Next slide, please. We see uh, where some of the areas of investment are. Uh, $30 million that uh, Josh was talking about, 20 from the city, 10 from the county. It's portioned basically uh, in, in this pie here. So prevention would be trying to, you know, it's going to, we're going to up the investment and in retention services for people in affordable housing, low-income housing that are vulnerable to homelessness. Safety office rates would would uh, include shelters, traditional shelters, uh, hopefully some shelters that are running 24-7, uh, much like the Navigator Center in uh, San Francisco, hopefully that would be the case. And also these or the support for these organized camps that uh, Josh was talking about. Uh, then you see the housing placement and retention dollars uh, and $10 million in capital development. And uh, we need to make sure that once that uh, money starts flowing into the pipeline that it's going to homeless people and not higher levels of affordability, which is sometimes a problem when we look at investments in affordable housing, as some of you will know. Um, I wanted to talk about a couple of other things, though, and issues around this kind of approach. Uh, and it's I think it's done a lot of the things here that Josh is, is hoped for uh, when the mayor declared it. There are going to be issues about one-year funding versus uh, continuous funding for a lot of these uh, services that are being, um, you know, we're increasing the capacity or launching. And that is if this money isn't uh, continued over the years, uh, we're going to have a problem using like rent subsidies for homeless people uh, when the rent subsidy could run out in a year or six months, for example or opening shelters that will be closed in a few months. So there are going to be issues around continuous funding and commitment on this that I think a, a number of providers are concerned about. The other is the population that actually uh, was uh, just talked about the visibility. What we see on the West Coast uh, is a, um, a fairly significant migratory population that moves all the way from Southern California, San Diego, San Diego area to all the way up to the Seattle area. Uh, depending on the season, one city or one area of the West Coast uh, might have uh, more experience with that. What we saw in the summer here this year is probably the largest influx of people during the good weather months from May to September. Uh, I don't know how many, but we know a lot of our downtown parks, some areas in uh, southeast Portland, saw significant numbers of people coming in and setting up camps. and that caused a lot of uh, tension and, and conflict uh, with businesses and residents downtown, but also in southeast Portland. And so this migratory population, uh, you know, uh, capital investments or rent subsidies, uh, it, you know, is going to have limited success in, in, in addressing that issue unless we really do have a regional uh, strategy on the West Coast. Um, so I'm hopeful about the alliances that have been created, but I also think we need to start looking at the long term. The housing shortages uh, I'm talking about are, have not been newly developed. Uh, it's been building for years. Uh, and I think we also then need to start talking about long term investments in very low income housing. And hopefully, uh, yeah, I think it'll be very hard to achieve, but we need a strategy in that area if we're going to be successful in the long run. With that, I'll end. Okay, good afternoon and good morning. Um, my name is Amber and I'm from Los Angeles, California with Homeless Healthcare Los Angeles. Um, and just a quick overview of our agency, we do a lot of different programming. We have several healthcare for the homeless, um, housing projects that we do. Um, we do an outpatient drug treatment program. Um, we have a training education department, and then um, one of our most innovative pieces of our agency is we do have a syringe exchange and do a lot of harm reduction strategies in Skid Row. Um, so we've been actively involved with working with the homeless population um, for over or almost 30 years. We're our 30 years old this year, um, and we are very committed to um, and excited about the opportunities that are kind of coming from um, the state of emergencies. Um, Los Angeles, if we can go to the next slide. What I wanted to do first, um, just because Los Angeles is so large and unique um, and we are recognized as the homeless capital, um, basically the county of Los Angeles is divided into eight different um, service planning areas. 
And within in 2015 was our most recent count um, when we actually um, increased in homelessness to over 44,000. Um, you can go to the next slide. And this just kind of demonstrates, so part of the concern around this is because since 2000, um, we've had a, uh, the 10 years to end homeless plans in a lot of our cities, but um, the biggest, I think, concern that came was why was there an increase? Because in around 2013, we've done a lot of um, implementation of the coordinated entry system, which really allowed us to identify um, you know, our homeless populations out there throughout the, the counties and the different cities that we serve. Um, the other thing that we did is our Department of Health Services um, allocated a lot of funding toward the Housing for Health program, um, which has been a tremendous push in, in housing our frequent users um, of our county systems and put them into permanent housing. Um, so I think in 2015, a lot of us providers and even the county um, was very surprised to see this increase that happened from 2013. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, and then this is just kind of a snapshot of um, that our Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority puts out. They are the main entity that is kind of in between the city and the county, they get funding um, from the, the federal and they are responsible for dividing out the funding to a lot of us community-based providers as well as helping um, the city and the county to manage the funds that are received. Um, and this, they put a really great report out and um, at the end of my PowerPoint I do have their um, web address so you can go on and, and read more about it. But this kind of just breaks down everything by, by ethnicity, um, the number of people, the ages that we're seeing, the number of unsheltered. Um, one of the biggest things that kind of, I'm going to kind of tie it into the, the reason why there was a state of emergency initially um, in Los Angeles is because the mayor has been committed since he took office um, to really fighting the battle against homelessness um, and recognize that there was over just 26,000 within the city of Los Angeles um, experiencing homelessness and also 70% of those were unsheltered. So we can go ahead to the next slide. Um, and part of that, when we were looking at homelessness with the county, we have the Board of Supervisors that oversee um, homelessness within the county. And typically, addressing homelessness has been a county effort and kind of um, the responsibility of the Board of Supervisors. Um, but the City Council and the Mayor really started taking more of a look at some of the challenges as well, and it became a higher priority for them. Um, and really because, again, Los Angeles it has, does have the largest concentration of chronic homelessness in the nation. Um, at this time, LA can only produce a fifth of um, housing needs to meet the homeless um, population. And then also due to the recent increase, the 12% increase in Los Angeles, um, LA right now is at risk for getting cut $28 million in federal funding because our efforts aren't demonstrating that they're having an impact. Um, and then one interesting thing I wanted to point out was that um, as we looked over this, um, over what it really would take in order to really end homeless, truly end homelessness in Los Angeles, it would take $1.85 billion over the next 10 years. And unfortunately, that's just in housing. Um, that's not in um, case management and retention to make sure that we can prevent new homelessness from happening. Um, and I'm not sure... Oh, there we go. Okay. So we can go to the next slide. Um, so basically in September, um, the mayor did go ahead and declare um, a state of emergency. And what happened was, unfortunately, it kind of got taken back and we really realized it was more of a crisis issue um, on shelters. Um, but the, the, I think the important thing to note is here is that Mayor Garcetti and several, um, seven council members did want to really make a, a take a stance and really um, emphasize that this is a really important issue and we want to work together, we want to support, it's not just the county effort anymore, it really is all of us um, taking a stance against this battle. So he kind of talked about the war on homelessness. Um, the other piece is that he really wanted to declare a sense of urgency, um, which also kind of allowed, which focuses really on the shelter system, because although we know that the long-term, and it is very important to note that the long-term solution is permanent supportive housing, 
um, for this population, we do need to do a better job because we have so many unsheltered individuals um, living out on the streets. And that was becoming, or it has become very visible in our neighborhoods throughout the county of Los Angeles. And then the other key thing about declaring the um, state of emergency uh, initially was that there's this political emergency, that he really wanted to call attention to um, that we need more funding and we need to work on this together from all standpoints, from our state level, our national leaders. Um, and that's also kind of why he said that his goal and his commitment is to, to find um, resources to be able to fund $100 million to solve this homeless epidemic. So that's initially why he did um, declare the intention behind the state of emergency for Los Angeles. Um, and then the last piece that I thought was interesting was that he talked a little bit about this functional zero for homelessness. So the ultimate goal is really to find adequate housing resources available. Um, he really wants to look at reducing the time of homelessness that people are in. He wants to make sure that we do find, you know, again, fund more shelters, um, look at how we can do that better, and then also as we transition them into permanent housing. Um, and then lastly, to reduce the cost of social safety and public health systems, um, which is a big issue in Los Angeles and across the West Coast. Um, next slide. So just to kind of elaborate a little bit more on after the mayor did declare the state of emergency, there was um, a little bit of a timing gap on a, on a plan. Um, and so both the, and I'm going to get into this a little bit more, but the, the city worked on with their um, homeless and poverty committee um, worked on drafting a comprehensive plan as well as the county. And so we have two different um, plans that we're working on as one city, <laughs> as Los Angeles. Um, part of the, the city's plan really does specifically hone in on addressing the shelter crisis um, directly in the city of Los Angeles, but also recognizing that there's not enough shelters throughout the county. Um, and so therefore they wanted to, their, their concern really came from the El Nino that's uh, hitting the West Coast um, and how can we make sure that we can get people into um, housing so they're not out on the streets during this, these um, harsh storms. Um, so we really looked at unconventional needs, um, opening it up more to faith-based organizations, looking at the ordinances that are in place right now. How can we open them up earlier? Um, we've been able to extend our winter shelter program through the end of April. Um, so it's done a lot in the um, immediate response to this as, as a result of, of declaring an unofficial state of an emergency. Um, the other thing that this city is focusing on um, is safer parking programs, which I heard our other um, speakers talk a little bit about in their cities as well, which is just creating um, safer zoning where people um, that are living in their cars or RVs can park um, in different parking lots, whether that's with providers um, that serve the homeless, but also um, in different public areas that are currently not being used for anything else. And then also how can we increase um, safety and security, um, and this is a little controversial because it is getting law enforcement involved in that, um, but the intent isn't for law enforcement to um, find these individuals, but try to create more of a safety and secure zone for them to, to feel better. Um, and then the other thing is looking at increasing our housing resource centers. Um, the mayor's really interested in finding more storage facilities, so um, we do have also a lot of make um, shift shelters like people are having a lot of tents and um, there's different things that you know our homeless um, residents are doing so to be able to put those down and have a, a place to store their items during the day um, and also include showers and public restrooms laundry facilities um, the other key thing that he's focusing on is really making sure that we have funding available for case management um, and because we do have the coordinated entry system in our city um, it's looking at how can we make sure that at every um, point where we're serving the homeless population, can we make sure that we um, are touching them with the system, the CES, and making sure that they're um, getting connected to, to those case managers. Um, and, then the, and then one of the other key areas is also looking at um, social enterprising um, and targeting hiring programs. So we really want to um, start looking at how can we increase the income for our, our homeless clients beyond once we get them housing, and that's a little bit more longer term again. Next slide. 
So these, um, between when I was looking at both the county and the city plans, um, there's a lot of it is very similar um, efforts being done, but they really fall into these categories. So I just wanted to highlight the preventative strategies, how do we prevent homelessness, the centralized case management, which focuses also with coordinated entry system, obviously housing being emergency, um, temporary bridge housing, we call it, as well as um, the long-term permanent supportive housing. Um, and making sure that we have adequate resources. And then the ongoing support is a big issue in Los Angeles. A lot of us advocates and homeless providers are really fighting that a lot of times um, we look at the big solutions, which is housing, but then we don't think about the, what it takes to make sure that um, we help clients to maintain their housing. So the retention piece and, and also which goes into the um, increasing income the social enterprises, helping people um, to have an overall um, enhanced quality of life. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide, please. So this I just wanted to, so around um, after the declaration of emergency was was developed or was stated, um, around December, um, October, uh, November and December, those months, the county um, again and the city were, were both working on comprehensive um, reports. And part of that process, um, did involve United Way um, along with um, they appointed um, Phil Ancillary to be able to coordinate with different providers um, coming from the county entities, public sector, sectors, community-based organizations, um, and really wanted to make sure that the voice from everybody that kind of um, has experience working with this population. So we had people from first responders, from our police departments, our our law enforcement, um, public libraries, um, and then again with like just the people that the shelter providers, the housing providers, and, and community-based providers. So they conducted a series of 18 um, summits to be able to learn more about these processes. And they really focused again on the categories of preventing homelessness, um, subsidized housing, increasing income, how to have like a no wrong door approach, a better coordinated case management um, system, looking at our coordinated entry system, and then even, and then it kind of gotten broken down into even smaller categories. Um, so out of these 18 policy summits came um, a lot of recommendations and strategies. Um, there were briefs that were developed and presented to our board of supervisors. Um, and that happened in February, and so just recently the Board of Supervisors went ahead and approved um, 12 of the 47 recommendations um, by the county. They uh, wanted to really look at the top priority um, to focus on right now that we could implement immediately, um, hopefully by the end of this fiscal year, which ends in June. Um, so they just kind of to, to look at those things. And some of the things that came out of that was the city um, released $12.45 million um, to add um, additional shelter beds, um, again, to the winter shelter program that we currently operate. So we were able to add 440 beds to the um, original 861 beds available at this time. So that, did, that has made a big impact. Um, of course, there's challenges that I'll talk about in a minute with that. Um, the other key thing is rapid rehousing. That was um, the city implemented 10.1 million um, to different providers to be able to um, try to quickly address the needs of clients that um, of the population that don't have high acuity needs. So these are intended um, in the coordinated entry system. Clients are given um, different acuity levels. So these are for the lower intensive clients um, and try to get them into housing as quickly as possible. Um, and the city report has about 50 policy and funding recommendations, and then the county um, also did release $15 million for rapid rehousing. Um, they do have already allocated, or they have already allocated $150 million um, in the homeless prevention initiative part of funding that they use. That's done over two years, um, so they're, they're, some of that money is coming from that pot of money. Um, and then, again, they have approved 12 priority areas and um, of the recommended strategies that came about from the policy summits that we held. And both reports um, are kind of like a blueprint that really does address on how Los Angeles is going to address homelessness, both in the short term and long term. Um, next slide. So the challenges ahead, of course, um, 
part of the reason why the declaration um, uh, state of emergency um, happened but then kind of got taken back was because although there is um, motivation and intent to secure $100 million, at this point we still do not know where that's coming from. So that's what the mayor and the city council um, is currently actively working on identifying those funding sources to make sure that they can really meet this commitment that they, they want to um, implement. And then also just looking at funding sources beyond the $100 million, because we all know looking at the one of the slides in the back that it's going to take $1.85 billion to really make a big difference. So how do we, how do we really reach that goal? Um, other issues are we still do have um, criminalization of homelessness. Some of our ordinances that have been passed, even as recent as the summer, um, having to do with sweeps and stuff, um, finding our homeless, you know, contradict some of the newer efforts that we're trying to do. And then, as mentioned in some of the other, um, with some of the other speakers, we really do have a severe housing shortage. So even though we have these rapid, you know, money's being allocated to rapid rehousing, for example. Um, or even we do have um, quite a few vouchers out there, Section 8 vouchers given to clients. It's been a big challenge finding um, apartments and units that clients can actually um, secure um, these because due to the landlords not wanting to rent to these special programs or just the increase in rental amounts in Los Angeles in general. It's very it's getting to be very expensive to live here. Um, next slide. So I just kind of want to conclude with um, kind of there are a lot of opportunities ahead. I think um, that this really has, I think this declaration are the intent of the declaration and really emphasizing the shortage um, of our emergency shelter crisis that we have, but overall just housing crisis in general. Um, I think the unique thing that's really happened is that we're no longer working in silos here in Los Angeles. It really truly feels that we are becoming more coordinated and we're trying to create innovative ways and build upon what we're doing versus starting from scratch, which can happen sometimes when new funding comes. Um, but really looking at how we can build on the systems with there's a lot of funding from our, our criminal justice arena um, with the realignment funding, the ACA funding, and how can we utilize that to, to help really address homelessness in general. Um, and, and one last point with Los Angeles that we did recently consolidate all of our county entities into one agency now. They're called the agency. So our Department of Mental Health, um, our Substance Abuse Prevention and Control, Public Health, and as well as our health department are now under one, one agency. So we're really hoping that that will translate into better collaboration um, and working together to really address the serious issue that we do have in Los Angeles. Thank you, Amber, and thank you to all, all of the speakers for the great presentations. Again, we're really sorry about the technical issues. Um, now we have a few minutes for Q&A. Uh, I believe this question would be posed to Mark because he talked about the West Coast Mayor's Alliance. We've had a couple questions about that. If you could talk a little bit more about what that is, how that came about, and next steps, that would be great. Sure, I can do that. Um, I uh, And I think that uh, our colleagues from uh, Josh and Amber from Portland and LA could could join in too. I, I guess it started with um, I think some of the mayors talking directly to each other around um, the issue of homelessness. Um, I think considering and, and talking with uh, each other about declaring states of emergencies and also um, overall solutions around homelessness. Um, a key milestone in forming the alliance was uh, in a, a convening in uh, Portland that Mayor Hales hosted um, of uh, five of the cities, um, including uh, mayors um, from Los Angeles, uh, Portland, Seattle, um, Eugene, and San Francisco. Um, and and then um, I think at that at that meeting they really decided we're going to form this West Coast Mayors Alliance. There was a press conference and an announcement about that. Um, the initial steps around that um, have been focused on federal advocacy and alignment of um, messages and asks and requests of Congress. Um, uh, additionally. Um, the mayors have worked uh, together to get more mayors on board, and that's uh, been successful. Um, I couldn't list all of them, but I know that uh, Honolulu and San Diego, I think Sacramento, 
have joined. So um, that's uh, that's kind of where things are. I think there are in, uh, aspirations um, on a number of levels uh, around the alliance, and and perhaps Josh or Amber want to want to jump in with more more details from their perspective. Yeah, and thanks, Mark. This is Josh. Um, you got all of that spot on. Um, and in fact, yesterday, uh, one of our congressmen was back uh, in the district and had convened a roundtable uh, on affordable housing. And he, he prefaced it by saying, I, I don't want anyone, um, when we go around the room talking about what the needs are, to talk about funding, because we've heard loud and clear from the West Coast cities. Um, and that was really one of the big points in kind of convening uh, the, the group of mayors and then forming the alliance was the idea that we would be much louder together. Um, of course stronger, but really louder. And um, in fact, at the convening that Mark mentioned in Portland, um, about a week before all the mayors descended upon us, uh, we got a call from HUD Secretary Castro um, from his office saying that he would be um, more than willing to come join for a little bit. And so he, in fact, did come for about an hour, uh, hour and a half, and participated in the discussion, which was really pivotal and critical, and particularly as a former mayor himself, um, was able to very quickly kind of get himself to the ground level to figure out what the needs were. I think moving forward for the alliance mayors, it is, you know, reinforcing with our local delegations the federal ask, um, but it's also just the information sharing. I mean, as as Mark mentioned, um, I know that Mayor Murray in Seattle went down to San Francisco to go look at their new navigation center. Mayor Hills and I did that uh, a couple of uh, months ago as well, and it's that kind of exchange um, that we find incredibly useful. And now, as as um, Ed mentioned, we are looking at replicating that navigation center here. Uh -huh because of the collaboration and the ability for us to go down and see it. Thank you. This question is for Amy Sawyer. Will cities' uh, declarations of homelessness as a state of emergency allow them to access federal disaster funds? Hi. <clears throat> this is Amy, and to our best of knowledge, that is not possible. Um, so, um, as I mentioned earlier, it seems like a very good tool to um, really galvanize and um, strengthen the local response and develop a sense of urgency and even strengthen partnerships with national and federal partners, but there's no new resources that would be unlocked by calling a state of emergency. Thanks, Amy. Um, so we have a question for all the speakers about examples of partnerships with private sector companies. I don't know if, if Josh, you wanted to start off, or Mark? I'm sorry, I, you broke up a little bit. Can you repeat it? Oh, I'm sorry. Do you have examples of partnerships with private sector companies that you could talk about? I don't know if any, any of the panelists have examples they'd like to discuss. Sure. Well, and this is Josh. You know, I, I had mentioned one with um, uh, the Menashe family and, you know, their loaning the city uh, a floor of a building, um, and we're building upon that as a model with our downtown chamber of commerce, um, who have had somewhat of a schizophrenic um, approach to um, the issues around homelessness, and we've been trying to move them out of the conversation on homelessness and into the conversation on housing, um, where they feel more comfortable and where we really do need their uh, attention, creativity, and resource. So working through the chamber itself, um, we're, we're getting there uh, on the private side, and um, it's, you know, I'm, as I'm sure everyone on the call will um, nod their head up and down. I mean, the innovation that's happening around housing right now um, is largely being driven through the private sector in terms of building materials, uh, modular, you know, all the different iterations of, uh, of housing. And um, we are both looking here in Portland and then around the country and around the world at what that looks like and um, looking at bulk purchasing potentially with other cities on, um, you know, modular housing and things like that. Thanks so much. We had a, another question. I'm sorry, go ahead. 
No, I was just going to, this is Amber from Los Angeles. I can, just something to add to, um, when, it, when we were doing the policy summits, I think this is important, we did actually invite um, people from private sectors, local businesses, um, and they were able to participate in the development of this comprehensive um, plan to address homelessness, and it was interesting to get their perspective and, and hear what their needs are as well. So that's just something to add. We had a we had another question come through. Just a few minutes we have left here. Um, talk about what do, are emergencies are time limited? Um, they potentially, uh, you know, processes that can be extended beyond that time limit. Are you talk. You were kind of breaking up there. Can you repeat the question? Sorry about that. We had a question about state emergencies being time limited. If they're if they're time limited declarations, um, and what's the process to extend them? Um, what does that time limit look like? And anyone can answer this. Well, it's Josh in, in Portland, and ours is time limited by a year. Three, uh, three votes to extend for six months, and then they can keep extending for six months. We looked a lot at trying to time limit it based on uh, events, you know, our vacancy rate going um, down uh, or going up by a certain percent. Uh, we couldn't quite figure out what the right mechanism was, and so we just did it based solely on time. Uh, and that's actually been hugely important for us as we're trying to cite uh, temporary camps and temporary shelter. We can peg it to the actual ordinance of the state of emergency and know that we're not hemmed in by the end of just a year because our assumption is council will go ahead and roll it over um, as long as they need to. Great, thanks so much. I think we might have time for, for one last uh, question. I think, um, Amber, you had talked about in, in Los Angeles having money for rapid rehousing, but the reality of there being a housing uh, crisis, that there, there really isn't a lot of places to place people. How do you, and anyone can answer this, not just Amber, but what, what do you feel about uh, the, 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 the sense of emergency response to homelessness and uh, available resources being there with with the fact that that many cities are facing housing crises. What what do you see as a potential solution, or what are some potential barriers that you're facing? Um, I think yeah, I think it's really great that we have. This. I think the the biggest barrier right now is timing because they really want us to demonstrate that there is a need, so they want to see outcomes done by June 30th. So, you know, they want to they want us to have the money that they allocated, the 10 million and the 15 million, um, so it's 25 million total um, in housing individuals. And I think that um, it gives us the opportunity, again, to kind of work together. So instead of, even though each different providers have been allocated this money, we're trying to create like a network on how do we, you know, find a pool of landlords that are willing to do this programming, get creative with like shared housing opportunities, um, looking at our sober livings if, if clients want to go into those types of facilities or boarding cares. Um, so I think by having a network working on this task together to, to produce these outcomes to show that there is a need and that this is a good solution, um, although it's very short limited, meaning that we have to do it really quickly, um, it's been helpful just to become and brainstorm different creative ideas on how we can market this and, and try to address these needs. But I think it's really thinking outside the box on how to come up with different types of permanent housing solutions um, versus the traditional, you know, supportive housing um, measures that we like to go to. Um, this is Ed Blackburn from Central City Concern. Uh, the basic thing right now is units at very low income levels. And so the affordable housing industry and the, uh, the investments we're making uh, I think all jurisdictions need to look at the proportion of those funds that are being invested and are they actually being invested in making units available for the very low income uh, that are vulnerable to homelessness or still on the streets. We need housing at various income levels at this point, um, but that's one place to start looking. But there's not going to be a, there's no replacement for increasing the number of units available. We've been refocusing on rent subsidies, rapid rehousing, and other measures that are very effective if you have uh, high enough vacancy rates um, in a geographic area. 
Uh, we are also having a very difficult time placing people even when we have the rent subsidy. So in the end, there's not going to be any um, substitute for making the units available to having the access and the capacity. Great. Thanks so much, Ed. So unfortunately, it looks like we've come to the end of our time. Um, I do apologize for all the technical difficulties we had earlier. Um, as you see up on the screen, you'll be able to go to uh, the National Alliance website, uh, inhomelessness.org, and get access to the recorded webinar as well as the slides so you can see what was missed. Um, but thank you all for attending. Thank you all to all the presenters. Um, this is a very timely topic, and hopefully uh, we'll continue this conversation after this.